This is Ham College, Episode 91, for July 31st, 2022. This episode of Ham College is brought to you by ICOM. Keep your competitive contesting edge with ICOM. back for another episode of ham college we've got i think what are going to be some easier questions tonight compared to the last couple of oh, yeah. episodes there's a few of them on there i'm a little unsure of but most of that stuff i think most people are probably fairly familiar with this, some of this stuff i think so i think so you you'll have heard of a good bit of this before maybe i won't have to hit the tylenol when i get back home tonight what did we talk about last episode? Well, it's funny that you mentioned that. I was just thinking about that. Last episode, I remember we talked about analog ICs, MMICs, and I believe we had a little IC packaging characteristics thrown in there as well. I, you know, I think, I think you're right there. To the best of my recollection. This week we're going to talk about electro-optical technology, photoconductivity, photo... Volteric devices, optical sensors and encoders, and optical isolation. Oh, that's always a good, fun topic right there. George's wardrobe tonight is courtesy of the Mr. and Mrs. VE3MIC sweatshop. <laughs> what? Wait a minute. Speaking of ants, that, speaking that, of didn't, sweat. <laughs> that didn't come out right. <laughs> Graphics, or I'm not sure what they what they call it, but uh, it's a very nice limited edition Ham College T-shirt here that's not for sale anywhere. It is nice, but it, it is, yeah, and it's got these two dudes on it right here. One well, looks like Dean Martin, except I don't see a glass. It does a little bit, doesn't it? What do you say <laughs> we we get on into the questions We're here? We're getting into something. Why don't you call it? Heads. And heads, that means... That means the, I'll take the first question. You've already counted to make sure I, the I bad one didn't I honestly come haven't. Up. I don't <laughs> okay. even have the questions up. I've got... This is the show run now. Okay. What absorbs energy from light falling on a photovoltaic cell? Is it A, protons? B, photons. C, electrons. Or D, holes. Hmm. Okay, what absorbs the energy from light falling on a photovoltaic cell? A, protons. Well, those are in, and it's like new with neutrons. I don't think it's going to be the protons. The photons, that's stuff they have to make torpedoes out of, isn't it? I don't know. Star it Trek. sounds kind of like Photon photo. torpedoes. Yeah. Um... It's not holes. Holes would just let something pass through. So I'm going to go with C, electrons. Okay. So you're saying it's C. I'm saying it's C, and that's my final answer. Well, what is the chat room? They're not even guessing, man. Uh, There's a couple of them. Are there? There's four of them. Okay. Yeah, all right. Not a lot of, not a lot of guesses, though. Well, four is enough. That's, well, there were four questions, four possible answers. But they all chose the same answer. It's pretty conspicuous, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think it is C. Judges say C, electrons. That. We haven't done that in a while. We hadn't. This right here just happens to be a type of photovoltaic cell. And I got something to say about that. Well, let's hear it, Professor. Photovoltaic is the conversion of light into electricity using semiconductor material that exhibits the photovoltaic effect, a phenomenon studied in physics, photochemistry, and electrochemistry. 
The photovoltaic effect is commercially utilized for electricity generation and as photosensors. A photovoltaic system employs solar modules, each comprising of a number of solar cells which generate electrical power. PV installations may be ground mounted, rooftop mounted, wall mounted, or floating. The mount may be fixed or use a solar tracker to follow the sun across the sky. Some hope that photovoltaic technology will produce enough affordable, sustainable energy to help mitigate global warming caused by CO2. Solar PV has specific advantages as an energy source. Once installed, its operation generates no pollution and no greenhouse gas emissions. And silicon has large availability in the Earth's crust, although other materials required in PV system manufacturing, such as silver, will eventually constrain further growth in the technology. Hmm. Other major constraints identified are competition for land use, a lack of labor in making funding available, the use of PV as a main source requires energy storage systems or global distribution by high voltage direct current additional cost and also has a number of other specific disadvantages such as unstable power generation which has to be balanced. Production and installation does cause some pollution and some greenhouse emissions, though only a fraction of the emissions caused by fossil fuels. Photovoltaic systems have long been used in specialized applications as standalone installations, and grid connected PV systems have been in use since the 1990s. Anyway, according to Wikipedia, that's about the first third of what photovoltaic is. Yeah, that's a, it's a really interesting topic. I've, I've got some stuff I want to do uh, on Amateur Logic sometime coming up with some solar cells. So i got some individual little mm -hmm. cells, and I, I've got a little experiment I think I'm going to try sometime coming up soon. Okay. Well, let me change the topic on you just a little bit. Okay. What happens to the conductivity of a photoconductive material when light shines on it. A, it increases. B, it decreases. C, it stays the same. Or D, it becomes unstable. What happens to the conductivity of a photoconductive material when light shines on it? Well, just, just for the verbiage in there, it's got to be A. I don't think it's going to decrease it. I don't think it's going to stay the same because there's some action that's going to happen because it's uh, photoconductive. Uh, and it's not going to become unstable. Photoconductive material, it's got to, it's got to increase. A. Hey. All right. Everyone in the chat room is saying A. Hey. Even the Canadians, A. Eh? Even the Canadian. A. Hey. A. Hey. All right. It's was pretty, that even your pretty, question, or was no, that mine? No, it wasn't, but I did, too. I just <laughs> okay. went ahead and went well, with it. I, I was going to say, A. Hey, hey. <laughs> okay. All right, well, then, it just turns out I have something to say about that, too. <laughs> What's the chances of that? <laughs> <laughs> pretty good. It's the first of an episode of Ham College. So, photoconductivity. Well, here's some centers right here. It's optical and electrical phenomenon in which material becomes electrically conductive due to the absorption of electromagnetic radiation such as visible light, ultraviolet light, infrared light, or gamma radiation. When light is absorbed in such material as a semiconductor, the number of free electrons and holes increases resulting in increased electrical conductivity. To cause excitation, the light that strikes a semiconductor must have enough energy to raise electrons across the band gap, not the gap band. Big difference. Uh, yeah. Or to excite the impurities within the band gap. 
When a bias voltage and a load resistor are used in series with the semiconductor, a voltage drop across the load resistors can be measured when the change in electrical conductivity of the material varies the current of the circuit. And some examples of photoconductive material include photographic film, like Kodachrome, Fujifilm, based on silver sulfide and silver bromide. The conductive polymer, polyvinyl carbazole, used extensively in photocopying, lead sulfide used in infrared detection applications such as the U.S. Sidewinder and Russian Atoll heat-seeking missiles, selenium employed in early television, Molecular photoconductors include organic, inorganic, and more rarely, coordination compounds. So there you go, more than you really ever wanted to know about photoconductivity. So I think you owe me a question or two here. Okay. I'm going to make up some good ones. How about that? Okay. Oh, yeah, this is perfect. What is the most common configuration of an opto-isolator or opto-coupler? A. A lens and photomultiplier. B. A frequency modulated helium neon laser. C. An amplitude modulated helium neon laser. Or D. An LED and a phototransistor. I just happen to know what an opto isolator or opto coupler is. I knew you did because I knew yeah. we used those in the past. And it has nothing to do with helium neon or any of the psychedelics. But that would be cool, but it's not. No, it is not necessary for that. Uh, hey, a lens and a photo multiplier. That's something you photographers use, isn't it? Yeah, actually, yeah. I've actually got one for my camera. Hmm. But it really doesn't work well as an opto-isolator. No, guess. it doesn't. So that only leaves D, an LED and a phototransistor. And the chat room, well, they're all saying D, so I think you know it's got to be D. And it is. And it just so happens... Got something to say about it? Not much. Oh, uh, but something. That's good enough. I got a picture. Pictures are good. And there's one right there. You can see uh, pins 1 and 2 have an LED on it. Pins 3 and 4 are a NPN transistor. When that LED lights up, that's a phototransistor, so it conducts. When the light goes off, it doesn't conduct. And the two are not physically touching each other. That means if you have a lightning strike on pins 1 and 2, or some kind of surge come in, the odds are you're not going to have any effect over on pins 3 and 4. It's not going to jump across and burn up your gear. So they're real good for isolating circuits for static protection. Noise isolation. Noise isolation, ground loops. I've used them in a number of things. They're pretty handy, like if you want to connect a couple of pins on your serial port to a rig. Mm -hmm. You can use that right there rather than a relay. Oh. All kinds of uses you can do with those things. I've heard that term, and I know with uh, some of the stuff we did, a project many years ago, mm -hmm. I know we used some of that, but I, I never really understood the basics behind it. But that's pretty cool. Since I did the double tap a while ago, you can ask me this one. Okay. What is the photovoltaic effect? A, the conversion of voltage to current when exposed to light. B, the conversion of light to electrical energy. C, the conversion of electrical energy to mechanical energy. D, the tendency of a battery to discharge when exposed to light. Hmm, I don't have any batteries that do that. I don't have any that I know of. What is the photovoltaic effect? The conversion of voltage to current when exposed to light. Sounds... Sounds pretty good. Sounds that's, plausible. That's not it. Uh, D, the tendency of a battery to discharge when exposed to light. Nope. C, the conversion of electrical energy to mechanical energy. There's nothing photo about that. 
B, the conversion of light to electrical energy. And there you go. That's it right there. A photo cell. Mm-hmm. Not a photoresistor. Right. So I'm saying it's B. Everybody in the chat room says B. And it is. All right. So we're two and two. All right. Let's see if I can uh, shift the odds here a little bit. Ooh. Which describes an optical shaft encoder, a device that detects rotation of a control by interrupting a light source with a patterned wheel. B, a device that measures the strength of a beam of light using analog to digital conversion. C, a digital encryption device often used to encrypt spacecraft control signals. Or D, a device for generating RIDI or RTTY signals by means of a rotating light source. It describes an optical shaft encoder. It's not going to be D. I'm just taking that one off the table right there. See, a digital encryption device often used to encrypt spacecraft control signals. I'm taking that one off, too, so it's going to be A or B. Uh, B is a device that measures the strength of a beam of light using analog-to-digital conversion. What does that got to do with an optical shaft encoder? A is a device that detects the rotation of a control by interrupting a light source with a patterned wheel. I think it's going to be A. I don't think it's... It's not C and D or D. I know that for sure. At least I think I know it for sure. And I don't think it's B either. I th I'm pretty sure it's A. And it is. That is an optoencoder. It's a patterned disc that spins... And it's got an LED on one side and a photo sensor on the other side. That's uh, vaguely similar to the opto isolator. Vaguely. Yeah. You're just interrupting the, the beam of light from the LED going to the photo sensor. We have that in most all ham rigs these days. This? Yep. And you never even knew it. Never even had a clue. Here's one right here, and I oh, can't really zoom it encoder. in. A rotary encoder. There's a little wheel in here, and there's an LED and a um, photo detector. And when you spin that, it's continuously variable. It doesn't have an end stop on it like a potentiometer. This is how you, the VFO on your rigs, most any modern rig, this is what they're using. Uh, a lot of rigs now are using this for squelch and volume and other controls as well. They might have an end stop on it, though, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. So that's you, cool. I, that's, I didn't realize that's how that worked. Yeah. I have a bag of those at home, too, for a project that I must. I need to have a box of incomplete dreams like Mike. Yeah. Well, that this one came out of mine. I don't know how many years I've had it, but one day I'm going to do something with it. I got a bag of like 10 of them. Yeah. They were pretty cheap. So you just, you're just putting a light through there and you're interrupting it and it's counting the clicks as are the pulses of light as you go by. Which of these materials is most likely, okay. Which of these materials is most commonly used to create photoconductive devices? A, a crystalline semiconductor. B, an ordinary metal. C, a heavy metal. Or D, a liquid semiconductor. Which of these materials is most commonly used to create photoconductive devices? Metallica. Well, it's not heavy metal. <laughs> it's not uh, liquid semiconductors. It's not an ordinary metal, so... I'm going to say it's a crystalline semiconductor. Yep. I think pretty much everybody knew that one. Yeah. Everybody was right on top of that one right there. That's That's got to be it. And it is. So there. Even the dean knew that one. 
Even the Dean. Even the Dean. So that's half of the questions for tonight. That's Thanks for joining us. Half, oh. No, it's only half. Oh. That's Well, it's half plus one. Keep your competitive contesting edge with ICOM. ICOM's high-powered base stations cut through pileups, letting you work the bands and record those contacts. Contest from the comfort of your home or remotely with the RSBA1 app. Heard it? Worked it? Logged it? The IC7300 is a high-performance, innovative HF transceiver with a compact design that will far exceed your expectations. This innovative HF transceiver digitizes RF before various receiver stages, reducing inherent noise in different IF stages. The IC7300 changed the way entry-level HF is designed. RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, large 4.3 inch color touchscreen, real time spectrum scope, and SD memory card slot. The real HF fun starts here. Create your own band opening with the IC9700. This transceiver brings direct sampling to the UHF VHF weak signal world. This all mode transceiver is loaded with innovative features that are sure to keep you busy. Faster processors, higher input gain, higher display resolution, and a cleaner signal. 4.3 inch color touchscreen TFT LCD, real time high speed spectrum scope, and waterfall display. Smooth satellite operation with 99 satellite channels, dual watch operation, and full duplex operation in satellite mode. ICOM's IC7610 is the SDR every ham wants. This high-performance SDR can pick out faint signals in the presence of stronger adjacent signals. The ICOM7610 is a direct sampling software-defined radio that has changed the world's definition of an SDR transceiver. RF Direct Sampling System 110 RMDR Independent Dual Receiver Dual Digicell ICOM's IC7851 gives you a new window into the RF world and is HF excellence unparalleled with faster processors, higher input gain, higher display resolution, and a cleaner signal. It's truly the pinnacle of HF perfection. Dual receivers, digital IF filters, memory keyer, digital voice recorder, high resolution spectrum waterfall display, enhanced PC connectivity, and SD memory card slot. Learn more about all these great ICOM radios at icomamerica.com slash amateur. We got more questions. But Just first, why don't we do something else? How about we give away this shirt right off my back? No, let's don't give away that one. What let's... about one like it? One like it? Yeah. We can do that. If you get one, you'll look just as good as, well, almost as good as I do. Yeah. You could be the next <laughs> Dean Martin at the Ham Fest. Yeah. I mean, that's as, almost as spiffy as a tux right there. It's pretty sharp. It's a good look. Yeah. So, if you'd like to have one of those along with whatever that's else wrong. Jesse can, Icon, sure. can stuff in the box, how would you go about winning that? Oh, easy peasy, man. All you got to do is send an email to hamcollege at amateurlogic.tv. You don't need anything but a name and an email address. You don't even have to have a license or anything. Just send your email. If you want to put a note on it, that's cool. We'd like to hear from you, but you don't have to. Well, this month's winner actually did put a note on it. Oh, that's good. Those, those are nice. And we did a random drawing before the show tonight. Who's the random winner? The, the random winner is Jim, K-E-4-Z-R-I, in Bristol, Virginia. He said he's hoping to win. Uh, Bristol, a town split in two, rendering two separate fire, police departments, area codes, and to dis our dismay, sometimes mayors. But the ham community is united. I sure would love to win. 7-3, Jim. Well, Jim, you're in luck, buddy. You d you just won. Awesome. Congratulations, Jim. Yep. Yeah. And if you want to be next month's winner, well, all you got to do is take 30 seconds and send an email to hamcollegesamateurlogic.tv. You don't even have to go into the political issues in your city like Jim did right here. You can... Or um, 
or not. <laughs> or you, you can talk about whatever you wanted to or nothing, as long as you got a name and an email address. Yeah. Ham College at AmateurLogic.tv. If you entered the a previous month, the queue gets cleared out at the time of the drawing. So if you didn't win, uh, be sure to put your name in again for the next drawing for next month. Yep. Good luck in the contest. 5-9. Okay, 7-3. <laughs> <laughs> what is a solid-state relay? Is it A, a relay using transistors to drive the relay coil? B, a device that uses semiconductors to implement the function of an electromechanical relay. C, a mechanical relay that latches in the on or off state each time it's pulsed. Or D, a semiconductor passive delay line. But it's not C, because that's the opposite of a solid state one. That's a real relay, a mechanical relay. Hence the name, a mechanical relay at the beginning. It's D, a semiconductor passive delay line. Nope, it's not that. Uh, B, a device that uses semiconductors to implement the functions of an electromechanical relay. Hmm, that sounds like it might be the one. But let's look at A. A is a relay using transistors to drive the relay coil. Well, if there's a relay coil, that's still kind of mechanical, isn't it? Because it's got to pull down the... I, I call it the plunger. I'm not sure what the exact name is. So I'm going with B. A device that uses semiconductors to implement the functions of an electromechanical relay without actually being electromechanical. So pull down the plunger. You were a plumber in a previous life. I was. That... Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. It's B. A device that uses semiconductors to implement the functions of an electromechanical relay. Chat room. Yeah. They must have uh, all been plumbers, too. They got it right. Yeah. But, yeah, it's not. There's a it, lot of no bees on parts. there. We're starting to get more answers now. They are getting awake. Why are opto-isolators often used in conjunction with solid-state circuits when switching 120 volts AC? A, opto-isolators provide a low-impedance link between a control circuit and a power circuit. B, Opto-isolators provide impedance matching between the control circuit and power circuit. C. Opto-isolators provide a very high degree of electrical isolation between the control circuit and the electrical circuit being switched. Or D. Opto-isolators eliminate the effect of reflected light in the control circuit. Why are opto-isolators often used in conjunction with solid-state circuits when switching 120 volts AC? Well, it doesn't have anything to do with the impedance, so we're going to knock out A and B right off. Uh, D, opto-isolators eliminate the effect of reflected light in the control circuit. That doesn't have anything at all to do with it. Uh, C, opto-isolators provide a very high degree of electrical isolation between a control circuit and the circuit being switched. It's like, almost like deja vu. It is. Like I was just thinking about this about 20 minutes if ago. If we just had a picture with an LED and a transistor. I'm going with B. No, wait a minute. Which did I say? Yeah, yeah C. You're... I'm going oh. with C. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I if, I know. Had, if I just could have reached that buzzer button quick enough before you corrected yourself. Yep. A, a lot of guesses in the oh, C in the chat room on that one. So, yeah. And it is. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. Yeah. Especially after somebody read like a page and a half. Uh -huh. about and it. drew a picture. Early, drew a picture, yeah. But it's, that's what it's all about, right? Yeah. Rain is coming it's, down out there. Uh, yeah, it is. I wonder if they can hear that. It is pouring. 
I think they can. I see it on the VU meters. You in the chat room hear all that? Yeah, they hear it. So it is rain. Yeah, it's a lot of rain. The studio here is in a metal building with a metal roof. Coming down pretty hard, too. But we're not going to let that stop us. What is the efficiency of a photovoltaic cell? A. The output RF power divided by the input DC power. B. Cost per kilowatt hour generated. C. The open circuit voltage divided by the short circuit current under full illumination. D. The relative fraction of light that is converted to current. Wow, I was hoping it's going to slack off a little bit, yeah. man. I was what too. is the efficiency of a photovoltaic cell? Well, it just so happens that we can. I kind of looked up some of this because we had a conversation with Mike not too long ago about he had posted something about them improving the efficiency of photo cells. But, but it was only like 3%, but it was like a groundbreaking. The output RF power divided by input DC power has absolutely nothing to do with that. Cost per kilowatt hour generated has absolutely nothing to do with that either. The open circuit voltage divided by the short circuit voltage under full illumination. No. It's going to be D. The relative fraction of light that is converted to current. So how much of the light actually get, can be converted to current? Okay. That's I'll, my final answer. I'll go with you. I'll, I see your point there. The chat room, they all do. And Mike says it's 27% efficiency versus 31.5. Uh, okay. Mike, that was not one of the choices there, but uh, that's, well, that's that's number E. Yeah, but thanks for clarifying that for us. It was about, it wasn't quite three percent. I don't know, somewhere in the neighborhood there. Three-ish. A relative fraction of light that's converted to current. What is the most common type of photovoltaic cell used for electrical power generation? A. Selenium. B. Silicon. C, cadmium sulfide. Or D, copper oxide. The most common type of photovoltaic cell used for electrical power generation. Um, I'm just going to go straight for the throat. Straight for the kill. Yep. It's B, silicon. Chat room. They are, too. The one that answered? Yep. They're, they're still answering. Selenium. I don't even know. Like, that's the only one that looks like it might even be right. I have no idea what, what those others are used for. It is. It's silicon. Mm -hmm. Wait. What is the approximate open circuit voltage produced by a fully illuminated silicon photovoltaic cell? Is it A, 0.1 volts? B, uh, 0.5 volts. C, 1.5 volts. Or D, 12 volts. This is one I'm glad you got. Yeah, me too, because I actually know what this one is. At least I'm pretty sure it's going to be B. I don't even know how to reason it out. That's just something that you kind of know. I'm pretty sure it's a half a volt. Were you like born knowing that? No, because I played around with some of those, those cells uh, I was telling you about. I have it Okay. Home. I'm just going to have to take your word for it because I don't know. But it, I would say B or C. Gonna be B. Yeah, I think B. I feel pretty confident about that. Oh, well, chat room's a little mixed on it. Um, 
Well, let's see if I'm right. Let's just see if it's, it's been made. a while since I used those. Yeah, and it is. Okay. Remember the guy in Dayton? He gave me the little bag of those. Yep. Up, up, of uh, rejects. Yeah. Seconds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've still got those. That's what I was talking about. Yep. And that's it. Solar cells are, are really cool. It's, a, it's an awesome technology. It's just a shame you can't really get more out of it than you can. Yeah. Well, you can get about 3% more now than you could last month. Well, you could. Well, well, I don't know if they're actually being produced yet, but... Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a good technology. It's just a shame it's, it's not more efficient. Yeah, it's not quite there yet. Yeah. But they're working on it, and there's some places that it makes sense to use it. I don't know if you remember, like, out in California is really a big deal. Like, people rent out their rooftops, and they put those up there. Like, I don't know if you remember me going up on top of the studio, the last man standing studio with John to see the antennas. They had uh, solar panels all up on the roof. They had just put them up there that, uh, hmm. that I guess they sell the excess he didn't give me all the details, but I know you can sell the excess back yeah. to the power company and stuff. It's it's pretty cool stuff if I you have excess. Years ago, seeing an array of them in Vegas between the airport and uh -huh. downtown, and I, I think those were the ones that tracked the sun. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, there's quite a few out there. You can yeah. see a bunch of them when you're flying over. Interesting technology here. Um, they're, they're usable, but they're, you know, we got a lot of days we don't have enough sun. Hmm. So, um, yeah, it's not like if we were in the desert, we won't quite get the amount of light here, but still enough to make it worthwhile at some places. I had a friend who, uh, who built a cabin way off the grid here and he he put in a solar array there mm -hmm. and a big bank of batteries. But he also had to put in a generator, too, mm -hmm. because some days, you know, or some weeks, there just wasn't enough sun to keep mm -hmm. the batteries charged, so the generator would charge the batteries. Yeah. But it's pretty cool stuff, though, but the, the battery technology is kind of what's, yeah. to me, is really amazing. You can't have the solar cells without having... Nice batteries hooked up to them. Yeah, but I mean, for a large scale, that's some big batteries. Mm hmm. Um, the price of them have come way down. Yeah. Well, for something like a consumer would use, yeah, they'd come down a lot. Well, the life pose, like the one I built, you can get yeah. bigger. You can get like uh, 300 amp hours of that for, it's not really. Consider what you used to pay for it. It's way, way down. Yeah. But think how many of those a utility company would need. Oh, yeah. I don't have any idea. But it wouldn't, you know. Yeah, it wouldn't be something for that. But like for your home, it's, it's actually fairly practical to at least yeah. do part of it. Mike says he's got to find that article about the device that generates power from moisture in the air. Yeah, I remember seeing that, Mike. Yeah, this would be and, a perfect place to try that out. And let's let's don't forget the cranium cooler. You oh, know yeah. that device was useful for recharging the sun. Yeah. So if if you didn't have enough sunlight for your solar panels, you could you could, fix you could that. use the cranium cooler to recharge it. My, you probably don't know what that is unless you saw it. Arnie says sun hours in Mississippi are five per day on average. I believe that. Yeah, so that's not, that didn't get the efficiency way up there. Yeah. Not to mention, yeah, you got like uh, all the trees, stuff, so you got a lot of shadows to deal with. Like, Yeah. Tell you what, why don't we take a quick break, come right back, chat a little bit, and then call it quits. Okay. Around the 15th of each month, it's Amateur Radio's original and longest running video podcast, AmateurLogic.tv, with hosts George Thomas. 
Tommy Martin, Emil Diodene, and Mike Morneau. Roughly, here's what I have. The bottom trace here is ground. While the elements will jiggle some, they're actually not too bad. It's light. After putting it together, I decided to test everything, so I ran in 12 volts, and I'm measuring the output here. No, it's not too windy right now, Jim. It was yesterday. We're in the antenna switching matrix. Any one of our six broadcast transmitters could be connected to any of the 22 antennas. I personally am so thrilled that George got the special award. Well deserved, my friend. That's really cool. Yeah, what about the Super Bowl, Emil? Did you go to the Super Bowl or were you at home uh, operating that night? Tuning my amplifier and oh, I lost power in the shack and uh, went outside. The house lost power. <laughs> the whole neighborhood went out for about yeah. 30 minutes. I, I don't know what happened. Oh. Huh. That explains a lot. Now we can take this and put it over inside our box. It's flush to the bottom. If we were to rotate, we can see that thing goes all the way through. So we'll have a hole in the bottom. What ammunition do you use in there? Uh, actually, you can use black powder. You can use um, <laughs> WD-40. You can use you know anything combustible. Um, you just have to use the right quantity. And uh, we assume no responsibility for mishaps. <laughs> Here's what it looks like after I've got them all soldered together and heat shrinked up. Okay, let's give it a try and see how it worked out. So there you have it, the hula loop. No, you can't null out the dogs barking. I have two thin film solar cells to run this. Looks like a little mini weather satellite actually. And uh, I'm using a guitar string for the antennas. I particularly like that last one there, $29.99. You can get a 50 foot garden hose extension cord combo. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Do not get cord wet. Now, most of these J-poles are built with metal elements or tubing. Uh, the reason I chose wire for this one is the length of this particular one. So I wanted to hang it from the tree so I can hoist it up there. Yeah. Go fishing. Well, we, we couldn't find the reel. <laughs> yeah. Is that what yeah. that is? All right, Tommy, sing the theme song here. A picture of the uh, cranial cooler. It was an invention that Mike, the E3MIC, came up with. New from the Skunk Work Labs of the AmateurLogic.tv apparel department. Created the best new product of the year. We bring you the latest in state of the art cranial forced air cooling. Keep a cool head while looking cool with this AmateurLogic cranial cooler ball cap. The power cooling fan unit is solar powered, so there are no batteries, so no charging required. Our patent pending power unit supplies power only under the blaring hot sun, ensuring that no photons are wasted. Some vendors may try to convince you that their product is the best, but don't be fooled by cheap, low quality imitations. Get the only cranial cooler ball cap endorsed by Professor Thomas. Order your cranial cooler ball cap today. Operators are standing by. My theory was if you could, you know, get in a strong enough wind like maybe riding a motorcycle or Mike thought riding the wing of a plane, you could actually recharge the sun by using reverse osmosis, spinning the motor, and then shooting light back at the sun with the solar cell. Now, we never tested that to know that it worked, but it did make uh, the cover of popular science, pop science. That's what it was. Probably not be the best year to wear a loincloth. <laughs> <laughs> I know year's a good year for that. <laughs> True. Just saying. Can we get some of those in, you know, for people who are looking for wardrobes? Oh, add them to the, to the swag shop? Aye. Yeah, this, this swag shop right here. Well, I don't know. I have to see about that. We do have a lot of other things in there, though. We got T-shirts, caps, cups, mugs, uh, their backpacks, a lot, a lot of things. We don't have a loincloth yet, but just keep checking back. It could show up. You never, you just never know. <laughs> if you want to get you some amateur logic or ham college swag, go to shop.spreadshirt.com forward slash amateur logic. Okay. That was a good save there. It was. I thought so. You know, a lot of Tuesday nights, I'm sitting here thinking to myself. Wait, hold on. Tuesdays used to be really boring. They did. They used to. 
Yeah. But not anymore, huh? Not anymore. You know why? Because why? we got a net, amateur logic sound check net. So if you want to check in on the net, any pretty much any kind of digital mode you can think of, we're connected. Echo Link, All Star, D, D Star. I'm not going to read them all. Uh, we need to actually update that because we're on uh, Ham Shack Hotline and Hams over IP now. Um, all the way, everything, even M17. Yeah, that uh, list hasn't been updated that I've got right there. But I'm, I'm pretty sure this is going to be the 120th net coming up this week. Still mm-hmm. going strong. We still have a great turnout. It's a lot of fun. So if you haven't checked in on it, be sure and uh, check it out. If you have checked in on it, hopefully we'll hear you this coming Tuesday. Hopefully so. It, it really is fun. It is. Spike wants one of the loincloths. Okay. So put him on the list, on the special list down there. Okay. Yeah. Probably on the double secret probation list, maybe. Loin cloth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what if you needed to join the fraternity for Ham College? Is there some place that you could go to hang out with like all the minded. cool, all the oh, cool kids in the upperclassmen. That's the ones I was thinking about. Oh yeah, man, we got several places for that. Facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Ham College is one of them. Or you could follow at Ham College on Twitter. You could, you could do that. We're also on MeWe, MeWe.com slash join slash Ham College. And if you'd like to be notified when there's an upcoming episode of Ham College or Amateur Logic. Or one of the nets or, or something special like that. We don't have uh, regular postings in there except to announce events. That's groups.io slash G slash Amateur Logic. That's where all the cool kids are hanging out. These days. Yep. And one other note, and that is about uh, the wiki. The show notes. For Amateur Logic and Ham College? Yep. You can go to amateurlogic.tv forward slash wiki and like a lot of the stuff, if you want to find out what was on a certain episode, then that's where you'd go find it. That's where we look. But you didn't find the cranial cooler. I did not find the cranial cooler, (laughs) but I will find that and I will fix that. Okay. (laughs) That's important stuff there. It is. It is. Okay, well, I th- I think that's going to do it for tonight. We appreciate everyone watching. And uh, class, you know, hit the books there, study up, go take your exam. They'll be giving exams over in Huntsville if you're ready. Might be a good time to take your exam. Yeah, Whatever. or if you're not ready. <clears throat> if you're not yeah. ready, you got three weeks. To, to cram? Yeah, to cram. Uh Okay. Yeah. Do we say something wrong? Uh, or right, one or the other. <laughs> so, uh, we look forward to seeing some of you over there. And uh, this will be my first ham fest since the pandemic started. This will be my second. No, my third, because I went to the Jackson one this year. Oh yeah, I had I had the COVID for the Jackson one. Yeah. So. Yeah. Cool. So I'm looking forward to seeing some of y'all there. Mm-hmm. 73, everybody. And uh, catch us in a couple of weeks for Amateur Logic. 73. What absorbs the energy from light falling on a photovoltaic 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 What absorbs the energy falling
following. <laughs> All right, Tommy, sing the theme song here. They didn't hear any of that. Well, it was great. You guys really missed it, too. Yeah. <laughs> he just sang the theme song. It was fantastic. Yeah. If I say so myself, thank you. <laughs>